This is Michael Woodward, and this is episode 83 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, a podcast focused on telling the stories of dreamers, makers, innovators, and influencers. Along the way, we give you some tips and ideas on how you can chase your own big idea and dream and create the world you want to live in. Our guest on today's episode is Eric Severson. More about Eric in a moment. Our guest on Thursday's episode is Maxwell Finn. He is the Chief Marketing Officer and Co-Founder of Unicorn Innovations. He is a serial entrepreneur. He has launched, grown, and sold several e-commerce brands and VC-backed startups. He has also appeared on Shopify Masters, ClickFunnels Radio, Making Bank with Josh Felber, and Dorm Rooms to Conference Rooms. Make sure to check out this Thursday's episode with Maxwell Finn. Do you have a big idea or dream and you don't know where to start? JumbleThink is here to help you. Coming up later this year, we're launching our first ever virtual idea camp. Idea camps are all about helping you, the dreamer, you with the big idea, create a strategy and a better understanding of how to take that idea from the idea state, from the dream state, and make it a reality. I want to make sure you're the first to know about it. So swing on over to jumblethink.com, go to the contact page, scroll down to newsletters, sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be the first to know when we launch our idea camp. Now let's jump into today's episode with Eric Severson. I am so excited about today's guest. His name is Eric Severson. He's a writer, speaker, adventurer, educator, and entrepreneur. When I say adventurer, I mean adventurer. He taught English for 10 years in countries like Japan, France, Thailand, and universities within the United States. He's traveled to over 80 different countries in 49 states. He's ridden motorcycle on six continents, and he's crossed the U.S. twice. He is also an avid mountain climber, and he's summited the highest mountains, highest peaks in eight countries and in five states. Beyond just being an adventurer, he is also an entrepreneur, and he helped grow a company from $7 million to over $100 million in 10 years. Coming up in early 2018, he has a new book that's coming out called Ordinary to Extraordinary. It sounds fascinating. I can't wait to pick it up and read it myself. You can check him out at ericseverson.com slash jumblethink, E-R-I-K-S-E-V-E-R-S-E-N.com slash jumblethink. And you'll learn some great things about him and be able to connect up with him. We'll have the links in the episode notes and throughout the episode. Let's jump into today's interview with adventurer and all around just incredible guy, Eric Severson. Eric, thanks so much for being on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's it's one of those days where, you know, you just check the things off the list. And so far, it's, I've gotten a lot done. So I'm happy about today so far. Those are always the best days. You just feel like everything in the world is okay. And your list isn't getting longer. And you're moving forward with life. It's, it's, it's a good day when that happens. It, it, exactly. This was one of those times when I was almost done with 15 things and done with none. And now, halfway through the day, I'm done with about half of them. So that's great. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. You have, you know, every once in a while we get someone on the podcast that is an adventurer, a true adventurer, and I would have to say that you would fit that bill. I, I, I'd have to agree. It's been a fun ride so far. So you spent years uh, teaching English all throughout the world, Japan, France, Thailand, all throughout the United States. Tell us a little bit about how you got the travel bug and how you got into being this adventurer that you are. So, so it, the, the bug kind of happened when I was about, I was 17 years old, just 17. And I wanted to ride my bike, um, between my junior and senior year of, of high school from, uh, Tacoma, Washington to Los Angeles. Okay. And so I, I, I got a friend of mine who was a little older. He was uh, in the Marines and a uh, name Yogi. And he, he decided, Hey, I'll, I want to do this too. So we got our bicycles and, and I had this old clunky bike and we started <laughs> heading South and, wow. and he, he got called into the Marines, um, for his, he was in the reserves. And so he had to leave halfway through the trip. So I'm 17 years old on a pedal bike traveling day and night by myself. And I, I, I really, um, loved it. It was just 
seeing the the country go by at the pace of a pedal bike, um, meeting people because I was alone, um, that was kind of the spark that really made me love travel. And then internationally, um, after I graduated from high school, my grandmother wanted me to go to Norway with her and the family, the whole family went, to meet the relatives um, because she came over from Norway. I was born here in the States, but um, I wanted to meet my, my relatives in Norway. And after I met the family in Norway, I took off and just kind of tromped around Europe for a bit, and and it just kept going. From wow. that point, it was just following opportunities, and okay. um, I think there are opportunities for everybody all over the place. I was one of the ones that didn't shy away, even when it wasn't logical. <laughs> now, did this like completely drive your your parents nuts? Here you are taking a bicycle from. Uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest down to LA or, and then you start on these adventures and you're always going and uh, how did they perceive that? You know, that they were, they were really good about as long as I was making um, what they considered to be good decisions, responsible decisions, they gave me a lot of freedom. And if, when I messed up a few times, they were really quick to reel me in. One of the most powerful things that my mom said to me when I was a middle teenager was she, I did something she didn't like, and I can look back and I can see why she didn't like it. And she said, <laughs> Eric, you have built over the years a wedge of trust, a, a, a circle of trust. And she says, I got to be honest, you've put a wedge in that circle of trust, and it's going to take some time to, to build that back for me. Wow. And so, and, and that made me um, really know that I'm responsible for my actions. And it did, it took some time to repair that trust with my parents. And, and I did, and it's been great. The, the, the hardest one for them was Africa. I was 19 when I decided I wanted to go see what it was all about in Africa. And okay. um, I was just 20 when it finally happened. And, and nobody helped me on this. I, I, I literally mowed lawns. Um, day and into the evenings for months and months and months to raise enough money to pay my own way to get to Africa. And I, and I, I hitchhiked from London to Zaire, spending wow. less than 50 bucks a month. Wow, that's crazy. That's, that's <laughs> really crazy. Yep. And Zaire is a funny name. Now it's, of course, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, back then it was Zaire. Yeah. Yeah. Now you talked about following opportunities as you were going on your journey. And, and there's a, one of my favorite quotes is by a guy named uh, Leonard Ravenhill. And he said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Where did you get this tenacity to just go for it and take the steps of faith or, or leaps of uncertainty into the world around you? You know, I, part of it is because a few people um, said I couldn't do something. And, you know, you've heard some people say that before. Somebody said I couldn't do it, so I wanted to prove them wrong, so I did it. Yeah. It wasn't like that for me. Um, but I'm going to go share two examples when people said it was impossible. Um, one was when I was 13, and I decided I wanted to play ice hockey. And everybody in the Northwest who played ice hockey in the league I wanted to be in had been playing since six or eight years old. Yeah. Um, so I taught myself how to skate, and it took me a year or 18 months to skate good enough to make the team. And, and, and I did it. And when everybody said it was, they laughed at me for going to the public skating at, you know, <laughs> Sprinker Ice Rink every Wednesday and Sunday and Thursday to, to learn how to play ice hockey. But I did it. And another bigger one was my high school. I was a poor student going up um, in, in grade school and middle school and things. And my Junior year, something clicked, and I decided, you know what? I want to do something big. And I, I, I started studying. Um, I, I went from a C minus to an A average, and really enjoyed it. But my senior year now, I'm having my, my consultation with the school counselor about where I want to go to school or what I want to do with my life. And I said, I want to go to UCLA. And she leaned over, pushes herself <laughs> back from the desk, and says, "You'll never get into a school like that." Wow. Closes her notebook, and that was the end of my meeting. Ninety seconds. Wow. So I and I and I didn't have to prove anything to this woman, whom I still, you know, it's I still have think of her with not happy thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't prove anything to her. But I still had my same goal, which was get to UCLA. Went to a community college. Um, went to Green River Community College for two years. Loved it got A's, um, did some other things while I was there, and got into UCLA two years later. So um, I realized that no matter what people said, I could reach my goals. I didn't want to lose focus just because other people didn't think it was possible. You have lived this life of adventure, and I've looked through and and your bio, and it's like a where's where of, of 
where Eric went and yeah. what he did and everything like that. You've really created this lifestyle of adventure. How do you approach adversity? How do you approach the unknown and really have all of uh, the where? How do you make those decisions of of how you're going to move forward and embrace the opportunities that are going in front of you? You know what, Michael, you have just actually taught me something about my journey because um, you said something about how do I embrace the unknown or something something like that. And as you said it, I, I kind of got goosebumps. <laughs> I realized that by putting myself into situations of uncertainty, um, that that nervousness that would come up, for example, in Africa, um, I walked large portions, like hundreds of miles in a row wow. sometimes, um, or not a hundred miles in a row. Um and sometimes I'd be walking into a village. Um, they don't know who I am, and <laughs> it's maybe evening, getting dark, and I'm walking into a village of maybe 150 people, and and I don't know where I'm going to sleep that night. I don't know how they're going to treat me. Um, it, but doing that repeatedly over and over, um, being going into the unknown, um, kind of allowed me to realize that, you know what? As long as I put my best foot forward, smile at people, um, good things generally happen. And there were some super scary things that happened. Um, I, I had somebody pull a knife the size of a machete out on me. Wow. I, I seriously to this today believe he was going to kill me for my stuff. And I pulled a knife back out on him. And we stood there staring at each other from 20 feet away. <laughs> and he decided it wasn't worth it. My stuff wasn't worth him maybe getting stabbed himself. So wow. um, everything wasn't perfect. But that... Going into the uncertainty over and over made me realize that that nervousness that you feel going into the unknown can be translated into really, really positive energy. What is one story of like the most crazy, the craziest thing, the, the most intense thing that, that uh, you just look back and you just, it makes you smile? <laughs> Uh, that's so one of them is uh with when I, I lived with the indians in south america the wayana indians okay and um and so one of them there is because i had a different one kind of in mind as you started the question but when you said makes you smile i'm going to this one so <laughs> i show up in the middle of the forest all alone um, i'm doing research now i'm a graduate student at the university of virginia and i i made a proposal to go down to study the wayana indians in in, in south america um French Guyana, the Northeast Brazil area. Um, so I get a ride up in to live with the Indians from a doctor. And this is all territory that's blocked off that you cannot enter. Wow. It's protected for the Indians to protect wow. them from disease and from exploitation from the outside. So I have my shots record is literally, you know, a page and a half, two pages long of different shots and vaccinations I've had that are unusual. So anyway, I got permission to go in. Um, a doctor goes in to give medical treatment to the Indians um, once a month. He goes uh, about three days into the forest uh, on top of the two weeks we're already in where he lives. For So anyway, so he drops me off with this tribe, asks if I can live with them. They say yes. Um, that night, I met some guy who said I could hang my hammock at his little hut. Um, the next morning, I wake up and I brought – I was going to be there for three months. I brought seven pairs of boxer shorts and I thought that would suffice perfectly. Um, I wake up the next morning and I see six Indians wearing boxer shorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, and I've still got one on, so that's all I got. They wore them for a few days and then kind of disappeared. So I literally had one pair of boxer shorts for, <laughs> for three months. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And uh, leadership with the Indians is something act actually that I learned. Um, the Wayana are very egalitarian. Okay. Um, they, 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 there's no official authority, even by the chief. Um, wow. So the chief, if he thinks something should happen, he does it by action, not by telling people they should do this and this and this. Um, I heard stories that the the chiefs uh, in the past, and this is a long distant past. This is you know not too long ago, that if they thought they should go to war with a neighboring tribe, um, he would pick up his bow and arrow and walk towards them. If people <laughs> thought it was a good idea, they'd pick up theirs and follow him. If not. He would go and die alone. Wow. Um, examples I did see with my own eyes are the chief would sometimes all of a sudden wake up. You know, we're getting doing, we eat a few things in the morning. He would pick up a hoe and go out and start hoeing the their little slash and burn garden. And other people would realize, hey, that's a great idea. So they'd pick up theirs and go start doing the same thing. And so it was a really good thing. And 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 I've seen that now in business where. I've seen leaders bark orders and get no results, and I've seen leaders speak very softly and lead by example and get tremendous results. That's really cool. It's a great 
lesson of leadership that you learned in a very unique place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In your adventures, in your travels, I've got to stop and ask the question that everyone I'm sure wants to know. What was the place that you just loved the most? What was the place that you would go back to over and over again if you could? All right. So as you said it, Thailand oh, and Thailand. France both popped into my head, and my answer is going to be Paris. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I stayed there. I probably have spent about a year there in my lifetime, but my longest one stretch was seven months. And um, it was, I was, I think, 23 years old. I'm living in this maid's quarters of this building about three blocks from the Eiffel Tower. Um, so it's a little tiny cramped space that was big enough for a tiny bed, corner kitchen, and and that's about it. <laughs> um, but it was a really neat time of intellectual exploration for me. Um, I, I had some very interesting, I, I through a friend of a friend, I met a really good guy named Sofian Jodri who lived in Paris at the time. He was my age. And, um, and it was just a really neat time of living the myth of Paris, okay. sitting on the left bank with a coffee in my hand, <laughs> you know, pretending I'm Jean-Paul Sartre Hemingway. And, and then there's a reality of Paris, I think, which is, you know, it rains quite a bit. There's too much poodle droppings on the sidewalk sometimes, <laughs> and people are arrogant and rude sometimes. Um, every, every light's a red light, if, you know, in a pessimistic way, so to speak. But there's also the myth of Paris, which is just this beautiful art scene, beautiful fashion scene. Um, I love being there in spring and just watching the fashion evolve from tweed overcoats to mini skirts and it was just beautiful um so yeah so pa paris is the one that uh, is my favorite place in the world that's really cool you studied anthropology is that right correct you mentioned that when you were in high school you're meeting with your counselor and and the counselor's like oh, this guy's nuts i'm closing the book i'm out meeting over how do you go against the 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 expectations of others or against the trends of what people are doing and really start to map it, map, map out your own. You know, that, that's a great question. And, and I do find myself sometimes being caught up into doing things and thinking, you know, is this, are people going to think I'm awesome for doing this? Are people going to think I'm dumb for doing this? So, so yeah, I, I do, get caught up into that sometimes. And then usually when I do get caught up into realizing that I'm doing something, not necessarily because I think it's the best thing that I want to do, but because it will make me appear one way or another to other people, I usually catch myself before I get too, too, too far. I take a deep breath and I rewrite down my goals, talking to myself only. Yeah. And I say, what do I need to accomplish to get to this result, which is a personal result, and it usually weeds out all of the chatter outside of where I want to go. Well, I think that leads to another good question, which is, what is your metric for success? What does success mean to you? That's that's a great one. Man, Michael, you're full of good ones. I like it. <laughs> so, so right now, I consider myself a very successful person because of this. Every, not every night, almost every single night when I'm going to sleep, I can't wait to wake up the next morning to do the things I do. Um, and part of that, you know, I've got a, a full-time job in a company and uh, I, I enjoy that job. I've got a business on my own, which takes a lot of time and I enjoy that. I coach people and I enjoy that every, every single day, almost. Um, I'm excited to wake up the next um, morning and uh, it's not just a selfish excitement for myself at this point because I am married and I've got two kids that are 11 and 13 and, and I'm excited for the things that they're involved in and sharing their experiences. Um, so, so I think, I, I think that's a big part of it. I think money is, uh, important. Uh, I like to be able to have money to do things that I want to do. It's certainly for me, not the most important. Uh, one of my favorite kind of like tidbits of information I got somewhere along the way was that evidently, uh, was it, was it, um, the, the big museum just in uh, Los Angeles, the Getty center. So yeah. John Paul Getty, evidently he used to write letters to his nep nephew who was kind of a vagabond and he would sign his letters from the richest person in the world to the wealthiest person in the world. Oh, wow. And I thought that was so awesome. You can tell in your voice that you are filled with passion and probably purpose, too. 
how have passion and purpose been a guiding light for you? And what does it mean and look like to live with a life filled with purpose and passion? That's another awesome one. Um, I wrote a whole book. Um, it's called Extraordinary to Ordinary, and yeah. it's 42 narratives about my life. Um, and and I, I, I shared a few things that happened in that. There's another one with a machine gun in my mouth. There's boxing in Thailand. So 42 narratives about things in my life. So I thought this is the most coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, so one of my editors, the first thing he said was, uh, and? And I'm like, what do you mean, Anne? He goes, Eric, you're not done with this book. And so <laughs> I, he said, you need to figure out the message because people seeing your stories is really, really cool. However, what's what's kind of like the message? What did you learn from all of this? So um, I, I read, based on a recommendation from a friend, um, a book called The Power of Meaning um, by Emily Esfahani Smith, I think is her name. Um, and that book says that basically there are four pillars of meaning and belonging is one, storytelling is another, transcendence is another, and purpose is another, and how these things are are actually more important than happiness. In the book, it, it starts off by describing um, if if they gave people the choice to live in a in a fictional uh, happiness tank, a tank of water, like a soap tank that you feel nothing but absolute joy and happiness for the rest of your life. Would you want to do it? And the answer was almost was no, always no, because they, they would rather roll the dice with a real life than have happiness. So in her thing, finding your finding meaning in your life is telling your story to other people, which I, I, I obviously love to do. Um, I, then also, um, it's being belonging with people, having connections. I have, I have mastermind groups I'm in. I have coaches I work with. Uh, um, I, I coach other people. So I create these meanings of belonging in my family as well that also do it. Um, and transcendence is, a, is kind of getting outside of yourself um, a little bit, realizing that you're a, a speck in this giant, giant universe that we, if that, that we, that we live in. And so I find my meaning, which translates into contentment, happiness, and things like that by working towards these things of belonging and, and, um, the big thing is connection. And she wraps up her whole book that all four of those things root down to love. Um, love is my favorite word. I think it's, it's, it's the root of everything good. Well, you, you mentioned the word meaning and first I've got to ask, do you think meaning and purpose are the same? Uh, I, I think purpose is actually one of her, of the four pillars of this book. So I think purpose is a really, really big part of meaning. However, I think that the purpose is purpose if it's alone. And once you add in belonging, um, and, um, storytelling with uh, the connection, connect, I'm using the word connection. Um, then it does have meaning. I think purpose is, yeah, it, it, it takes something else to give it meaning. So you, you talk about purpose being a part of meaning and you talk about belonging being uh, a part of meaning also. It seems like in our culture and civilization, in our time in history, we're more connected, but yet less engaged with each other. There's not a true connection. There's not a true sense of tribe and community anymore. Uh, there's this virtual community, and it seems that we've watered down or uh, created something that isn't true community a true place to belong, where we truly feel like we belong and we fit in. How can we create that that sense of tribe, that sense of community, that sense of belonging? Yeah, um, another one I love, Michael. Um, it's, I think that superficial things don't go very far in, in, in my book. Um, I think you're right. Things have become super watered down um, in, in a lot of relationships. And I think some people are are, are forgetting how to have true bonds with people and others sadly uh, in a younger generation um, aren't have never experienced it um, and don't know that what what it exists one thing that happened to me and this is quite a while ago this is probably 20 years ago um, I was at a I'm in my 20s um, I was at a cocktail party and I am bored stiff um, I was there because somebody asked me to go and I said to myself you know what I'm not going to talk about all this ridiculous weather type stuff that's being talked about. I'm going to talk about exactly what I want to talk about. And I don't care who likes it or who doesn't. 
Within 10 minutes, I'm in, in this engaging conversation with some guy I just met over relationships that we each have with two different people and we're talking about it and it was really awesome. And I thought that was at the end of the night, I talked with him, I talked with other people about things that I liked. I talked about things I was reading. I talked about things that they were reading. Um, at the end of the night, I'm like, that was a blast. I made a conscious effort to not get caught up in talking about the bland stuff, but to talk about what I want to talk about. And if they want to talk about something else, that's great. If I'm not interested, you know, um, it depends on the situation. Sometimes I'll entertain it for a little bit, but I'll, I, I, I generally won't. But usually what it does, it becomes a give and take of as soon as I get vulnerable and give them something real about myself, they'll get vulnerable back to me and I'm happy to sit and listen to a conversation um, like that. In, a, in the social media space, um, it's it's I think I think it is possible to have greater uh, connections um, online. My I, I have a, a Facebook um, page which I really really like and it helps me connect mostly with you know some people I work with but also high school friends. That's my kind of my one of my biggest joys of my Facebook page is my high school friends. But not all of them want to hear me pound about some philosophical idea I just had. So I've got another. Uh, Facebook one that is more private call and I call it beyond the line. And with that one is the place I connect with the people who do want to go beyond the line of normal. Um, and so those are, th those are really important things. Um, I, so yeah, yeah, there, there, there we are. Well, it sounds like what you're doing is you're being aware of significance and instead of sitting on the surface, doing the, you know, talking weather, talking, Sports and sports can be a great conversation. Don't get me wrong about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, um, it sounds like like you're actively saying I want to have significant interactions, interactions that that have depth and power behind them, and not just uh, you know are cruising at surface level. Absolutely, and um, any uh, when the the important interactions I have, and which are most of the interactions I have. I'm either wanting to promote myself, make myself better, or make them better. And I don't care which one it is, as long as one or the other or both are somehow getting better, uh, that really makes me happy. Let's talk about persona versus authenticity a little bit. Uh -huh. You uh, are doing all this stuff, and it's easy for people to perceive people as something that they're not through... Um, the things that they see, the things that they hear. How can we be more authentic with one another? One of the main ways is kind of a word that I used earlier, I think, and it is that 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 wor word vulnerability. Okay. Um, that by by laying it out in, in some things, sometimes having a persona, I think, isn't necessarily bad. So when I'm traveling, for example, I'm always, say, for two and a half weeks on a business trip, um, it's, it's a lot of work. I, do I enjoy it? Yes. However, they're often 16 hour days. You know, you've got a meeting in the morning, you've got things going on in the day and then some a dinner meeting and sometimes there are, there are drinks afterwards. And, um, it's, it's absolutely insane how much time, effort and energy it takes for these meetings. Um, and people kind of, you know, see me on Facebook. Hey, here's Eric in London. Great. Isn't that awesome? And, and they see me tromping tromp around Europe and, and, and that's awesome. And I don't really even care about that. They don't need to know the reality that, that I'm actually working 16 hour days and it's, <laughs> it's, it's really a lot of time and energy and I'm exhausted. And so, so that part really doesn't bother me. It's kind of funny. You talk about you're now married. You have, I think you said two kids. Is that right? Yep. That's right. Is that's been a massive shift for you? I'm sure. How has that impacted your worldview and and how you approach adventure and approach the world as a whole. Oh, I, it's so fun to see the world through my kids' eyes. They're, they're two boys. They're 11 and 13. Um, and, and I will never say I'm living vicariously through my kids <laughs> because I'm living it with them. Wow. Um, we're climbing mountains together. We're, you know, doing different things there. So they're 11 and 12. We talk about setting goals. Um, they, they, I, 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 I 
if they bring it up again, it's a goal. They've mentioned it three times now. So they want to run a marathon this year. Um, and uh, I didn't run a marathon when I was 13, but <laughs> it's a goal that they're, they're starting to have. And if they do, if they're serious about it, um, I'll foster that. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, it has been a struggle, though. It's a little easier now that they're 11 and 13, but when they were 2 to 8, um, you know, it was a really a bigger challenge to balance that triangle of work, uh, f uh, private life, because I need to do things myself. I, I, I need to go climb mountains, for example, by myself or with people who climb mountains, not my kids and family, um, and then the family. So work, family, myself. And there was a point where any two things I was focusing on, there was a third that wasn't getting enough attention. Yeah. Um, and sadly, um, to be honest, my wife was the one who got the least attention often. And it was, a, it was really a bad thing. Um, my kids, I never really let up on getting them too much attention. Um, my work, you know, sometimes it would, it would get less as well. My personal life certainly got a lot less. So balancing that triangle was tough. And, and I've gotten better at doing that by one thing is becoming a fanatical list taker and managing my time a little bit better. I'm waking up a little bit earlier. And I tell myself when I'm with the kids or my wife, that's my focus. When I'm at work, that's my focus. When I'm climbing a mountain, that's my focus. And I'm not constantly thinking about the other one. I'm doing one. It's being present in the moment that you're faced with at that time. Absolutely. We talked about the significant for significance of getting out on your own a little bit, which is hard to do when you've got so many responsibilities. You know, you're going for that hike. You're going uh, for that uh, place to reflect and recharge. How does that impact your life to have those moments where you're maybe doing a pilgrimage uh, to do discovery or reflect or, or go deep um, and discover what you're really thinking and what you're really processing? That, that, that is so important. The fact that you bring this up makes me think that you understand this, that <laughs> it is important for people to take time alone. And that's, I think, one of the biggest neglected areas. Um, I have that triangle of self, work, and family. I think that way too many people think that there are two things, family and work, and they neglect the self. Um, I, 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 when I climb a mountain now, often it's a big one. So I have to fly to another state or country. Um, I get the people who I'm climbing with and we spend, you know, two or two, two or three days on the mountain. Um, and so that, that's a selfish thing when, if you look at that th uh, triangle a little bit, however, the time I have tromping up a mountain roped to people who were say 50 feet of apart from me, um, alone with my thoughts, as soon as the struggle becomes really big, so I'm, I'll use Mount Rainier for one of my examples a few years ago, well, I'm climbing and I'm thinking to myself, why in the world am I doing this? My legs hurt. I have to take a breath every two steps. Um, I haven't slept for over 24 hours and we're tromping up this thing. And, and then all of a sudden I start to think about my life in my exhaustion. I, th I start to think about my life Without all the comforts that are unnecessary, I start to think about how important my family is, how much I enjoy my job, and what I could do differently. So that time to absolutely go into your own head is, for me, fundamentally important and hugely, hugely missed by, I think, too many people. And it doesn't have to be a mountain. It could be, it could be meditation for some. It could be jogging for others. So there are other, other things it could be for sure. But something, I think, has to be there where you're alone with your own thoughts. And I, I, want, I want our listeners to understand this. When you say climb mountains, you've summited uh, the highest peaks in eight countries and five states, uh, right? Yes, that's correct. So it's, it's like legit climbing. It's not like, hey, I'm going to go walk down the Appalachian Trail for five miles. <laughs> so, <laughs> Which is awesome in itself, too. But yeah, you're right. There's some ice axes involved and a helmet. Yeah, right. Let's talk about your book, Ordinary to Extraordinary, right? Uh -huh. uh, comes out late February of 2018. Correct. What's the premise and what are people going to learn from reading this book? So it started off, most of these things, I told you it's 42 first-person narratives that are all true, um, and it deals with things from Civic Cafe in Paris, like I mentioned, to inside the uh, clubhouse of an outlaw motorcycle club. Um, it's, so there are some pretty intense situations, the Indians I mentioned, Africa that I mentioned. So it started off, so a lot of these I started writing when they happened, and there are some hippie trip ones, there are some hitchhiking down to a rainbow gathering and at the Oregon <laughs> County Fair and the Grateful Dead concert, that one's a funny one. And so, but 
it, it's for, so for me, I started writing these when I was young. I didn't finish most of them because I was just on to the next fun thing. But then now about three years ago, I started finishing the ones that I hadn't finished. And then I started writing other ones from start to finish. And it started with just my personal uh, joy reliving these experiences as I was putting them onto paper. Um, and then, like I said, I re I, an editor real, made me realize I need uh, more. So now I've divided them into four groups. Uh, one group is in belonging, all, all these 10 stories or whatever it is that somehow show uh, an example of belonging and how that impacted my life in a positive way. One is about transcendence and that, that Grateful Dead one happens to be in the transcendence uh, <laughs> section <laughs> about how transcendence is a part of my life. The other one is about purpose. What, what These ones deal with purpose and storytelling um, is the, 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 ne the next fourth quadrant. And it kind of comes together that these things provide meaning and here's kind of how, and it's uh, applicable to more than just myself. That's the goal. In your adventure of creating the book, uh, and as you're creating and writing, what is one of the things that you've learned about yourself? Uh, one, one thing I realized is that I love writing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, as, as I was doing it. And um and a lot of it was there, there were certain things that it did make me want to go deeper and not. Um, but it, just a big part of, of it was the excitement of reliving this. And I started writing it for myself. I didn't have any idea up until about a year ago that this would out of three, that this would be a book that I would want out for other people. Uh, so it started off as a self journey. And, um, as I did it, I realized how beautiful that discovery was, um, reliving but moments from my life, I encourage anybody to just get a piece of paper, get a pencil or get your computer out and start writing um, to write down, just pick a few of the special moments of your life and just turn it into a small story from first person. Um, and you, I think anybody who does this will be surprised, one, how vividly it all comes back to how easily it is to get it onto paper and don't worry about mistakes. Just write and, and write it for yourself at the start. And if it does turn into something bigger, that's, that's a bonus. Um, but the joy of discovering myself by looking at a snapshot of who I was 20 years ago and 10 years ago and 15 years ago, um, really made me happy. That's really cool. Now hearing your stories and knowing that you're going to open up so much more through this book, highlights the fact that a lot of people are going to see you and see you as fearless, see you as a person who maybe is superhuman. I mean, your book title, Ordinary to Extraordinary, right there. It's like, here's this person who's done all of this stuff and experienced so much. I could never be like them or like him in your case. How can they overcome their fears and start moving from ordinary to extraordinary? Are too extraordinary. The 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 one is, and this is kind of highlighted in the in the book too, where um, I, I I really there was nothing extraordinary about me, and really there is nothing extraordinary about me. However, um, my actions, um, I think there are are some very extraordinary actions. Anybody has the choice to create extraordinary actions in what they choose to do. Um, and so it's just, it, there's nothing, absolutely nothing special. If people are waiting for somebody else to help them become, do something extraordinary, it's not going to happen. Um, and I think it just starts out, it starts out with taking time, write down a few things that are interesting to you, write down, turn a few of those into goals and then start taking steps towards them. And the first mountain I climbed wasn't Rainier. Um, it was, a, you know, a smaller one and, or Zugspitze in Germany. Um, so it doesn't have to, you don't have to start with the, the biggest thing, but yeah, just get a focus on it and action. Um, one of my biggest, and when you talk about fear, um, I truly believe pain doesn't exist um, is, is one that's a whole nother story. Um, sure, you, your body, you, you sense something, but you can interpret it as not pain. You break your finger, your finger's still broken, and that's a bad, bad thing. But pain in itself um, is, 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 to me, a, a state of mind. And the same thing with fear. Um, I think fear is a very positive force. If it becomes dehabilitating, 
you've allowed your fear to make it negative. However, kind of like me walking into a village when I didn't know anybody at dusk um, in Africa, um, that fear and turning it, turning it in, my, my adrenaline's up a little bit. I'm kind of like at the best of my game. Um, and that, that's in business, that's in entrepreneurship, that's in uh, sports as well, you know, everything, I think. So translating fear into something positive is good. And I, I was at a conference last week um, and Adam Flores said something genius. He said, if you're helping somebody, fear is non-existent. And uh, it's a, it's and he gave an example of, hey, if I asked you to go out and give that homeless person who's sitting in front of the hotel a dollar, um, how would you feel? Well, yeah, I'd feel fine. Okay. I, if I asked you to go to walk up to somebody wearing a suit in line registering the hotel and ask him for a dollar, how would you feel? <laughs> and they're like, no, I'd be embarrassed. I'd be nervous. I'd be scared to go up and talk to this guy and ask for a dollar. And so the idea is if you're helping somebody, the fear goes away. So often we live lives that are stuck. We're stuck in a job. We're not fulfilled. I hear the stories all the time from people I'm talking to. Oh, I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm just doing my job. I'm, you know, and, and they're like, oh, I wish I could do X, Y, and Z, but that's not my uh -huh. life and I can't do it. How can breaking our routine, breaking that place of safe or known or expected, really set us up to change our life? Absolutely. A frog, of course, you've all heard the stories of a frog in lukewarm water goes to boiling and it'll sit there and not change. So many people are doing the exact same thing and they don't even know it. They don't even know it. That's the scary part. Um, I think breaking a routine is fundamental and keep on improving. So what do I do? I have some things I do intentionally on this and my kids like to get into it with me. So at least every two weeks, I will, I'll, I will have my shower when I take my normal morning shower on the coldest setting of cold it is with no hot water at all. And you'd be surprised, the first few times I did it, I couldn't even make it 10 seconds. <laughs> and now I, 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 I force yeah. myself. And when I was living with the Indians, that river water that I had to bathe in every day was the same temperature as this freezing cold water. And so that's one way I break my routine. And another way is I sleep outside um, about uh, every three months or so. Um, and I, sometimes I'll fast for a day. I won't eat any food. My kids do it with me for a full day. Um, so I, I don't do let my kids do this one, but about once a year I'll stay awake for 24 hours in a row, or usually it's 48 because it's the night between two days. Yeah. Um, and so I do these things to break my routine, my routine and, and, it, and one, it makes me not take things for granted, like the roof over my head or the food I have on my plate. Um, and two, it allows me to just change my assemblage point, to use a Carlos Castaneda word, and, 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 and get into a different state a little bit. And I just look at my day. When I take a freezing shower in the morning, I look at my day a little bit differently that whole day. <laughs> That's good. What's the next adventure you're looking forward to? Um, I, uh, Mount Elbrus is the highest in Russia and it's a pretty big one. It's 19, 18 or 19,000 feet. So that's, that's one, um, I'm excited on, um, Aconcagua is the highest in the whole Western hemisphere and that's 23,000 feet. So those are two big goals. I'd say Everest and I, and I, and I do have Everest on my list, but it's, a, I, I understand that it's probably not going to happen and I'm okay with that. Um, but, El, but Aconcagua and, and Elbrus are two mountain climbing adventures that I definitely want to do. Um, as far as business, so I'm developing, I taught English as a second language for over 10 years. Um, like you said, I taught in different countries. My last one was at UCLA Extension. I was teaching there. Um, loved it. Absolutely great. But, you know, I couldn't support my family in LA um, doing that. So I went into business for 10 years. Then I decided, you know what? I've learned all these things from Dale Carnegie, from the Ford, from Napoleon Hill, all of these. And then, of course, Tony Robbins and Brendan Richard, all these great people who have taught me so much how to be effective in business. And I realized nobody's using that in uh, language learning, maybe in education. I haven't seen it in education at all, but per, for sure, I haven't seen it in language learning. So I created a company called Language Link with a Q, um, and it's to teach these success strategies and motivated motivational principles in language learning. Um, and, and that's a huge goal of mine is to, to, 
to help people's lives in English by making it easier for them to see, succeed in English. Education is something I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the episode, so I'll just ask one question about education, the world of education. You have uh, an interesting path on your journey of education. You went from being a, uh, a child who did not excel in education to a person who loves engaging in learning. What is the biggest lesson that you think as a culture we can learn about education that we're missing right now? Um, I think in education, a long, long time ago, education was taught broadly and literature helped bring thing, life principles into that. Of course, you had your science and your things. Philosophy helped bring things into that. I think we've become so compartmentalized in education that an engineer is going to study engineering, um, a social uh, scientist is going to study social science. Uh, you've got you know, the physicist who's going to study physicist and the, you know, the, the person in literature who's going to study literature. Um, I think it's important to, to look into the other areas a little bit. If I'm in science, I want to read as much literature as I can. If I'm in literature, pick up a book and it doesn't have to be, um, a really intense science book. It could be something, you know, maybe for the popular Stephen Hawking, for example, who, who, who writes popular science or has Michio Kaku is another example. Um, so I think broadening a little bit really helps um, helps us see a bigger picture. We've talked a lot about so many different things. Uh, there's going to be some people that might connect with you. How can they find or connect you or connect with you? So it's a uh, easiest way is on my website, and I've got a few, but I'm just going to give you give you one. Um, it's ericsieverson.com, and that's E R I K. S E V E R S E N dot com. And a lot of people miss the C for a K and the E for an O. So it's Eric Severson with a K and an E. Um, I actually am going to create a, a landing page just for, for you, Michael, and your listeners, which okay. is Eric Severson dot com slash jumble think. And I'm going to maybe highlight a few things that I've talked about. There will be pictures. If I mentioned Africa, I'll try and get some pictures on Africa. Um, and so, so that'll be for your listeners. And, you know, it's a way for them to connect with me. And, and I'll, I'll have links to my, the Facebook page that I mentioned that's a little bit more private and things like that. We'll make sure to include those in the episode notes too. Excellent. Perfect. Let's, tra- uh, let's jump into our rapid fire questions. These are questions we ask every guest on the episode. Our first question is, what is one tip you would give someone with a big idea or dream and they simply don't know where to start? Absolutely. It would be to write down your goals. Um, and then after you write down your goals and write big ones, but then divide it up and have, you know, smaller steps, uh, a three month goal, a one year goal, a five year goal, for example. Um, so that's it. Write down your goals. What's one change you'd like to see in the world? I'm, I feel ill when I see how much divisiveness there is in the world. Um, and that's within the United States. That's between countries. That's all over the place. And one change would be if there were simply less divisiveness and people would take a big, giant, deep breath and realize we've all really got the same goals. What do you want your legacy to be? I think it would be to just to, to make people's lives better um, and more meaningful. It sounds kind of cliche, but that, that really is. The, some of the, the things I consider my biggest successes, I can think of individual students, and I'm picturing one in my head right now and how I impacted his life, his life for the positive, and I'd like to do that for more people, and that includes my family. My family and extends out from that. Who or what inspires you? My goals inspire me. Um, when I say that I go to bed every night, can't wait to wake up the next day. The reason is because I've got certain things, steps I want to take that next day towards my goals. Um, also, I've got um, coaches that I work with. They inspire me a lot. Um, and so, and my, my family inspires me as well. What are you currently reading or watching? I, I, the Blade Runner, the original, um, is one of my all, all, all time favorite movies. I've got a personal relationship I feel with Roy Batty. I like that guy. So um, I, I recently watched the the new version, um, Star Trek 1940, or no, 2049. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, reading um, The Power of Meaning, I, I mentioned I'm spending a lot of time with that book. I've read it more than once now because I'm using it for, for my book. And also The Art of Social Influence um, by Adam Flores. And he's a upcoming star in in um, San Diego with uh, social media um, training. 
And he, it was his seminar I was at last week. So I'm reading the book that I got at his seminar. That's it. Among other things, I've got a lot going on in my reading list. Yeah, for sure. What is one dream you're still wanting to fulfill in your own life? I'm going to go back to um, uh, Aconcagua and Elbrus. So um, those the, getting those two two mountains um, are are yeah yeah. Look forward to that. So mountain climbing, mountain mountain climbing. I'm going to use my my personal triangle out of the triangle of things I'm involved in one for that. Eric, it's been a lot of fun having you on today's episode. Thanks so much for taking time out and sharing a little bit of your life, a little bit of your uh, insights and wisdom with us today. Well, Michael, thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I've listened to the Jumble Think podcast quite often and uh, really happy to now be on this side of it. Appreciate it. Once again, I want to thank today's guest, Eric Severson, for taking time out to share a little bit of his story and what he's creating. You can check out ericseverson.com slash jumblethink to learn more. Again, that's ericseverson.com slash jumblethink, E-R-I-K-S-E-V-E-R-S-E-N.com slash jumblethink. We'll also have the link in the episode notes. On Thursday, our guest is Maxwell Finn. He is Chief Marketing Officer and Co-Founder of Unicorn Innovations. He is a social entrepreneur, and he's launched, grown, and sold several e-commerce brands and VC-backed startups. He's also appeared on Shopify Masters, ClickFunnels Radio, Making Bank with Josh Felber, and Dorm Rooms to Conference Rooms. It's a super fun episode, so make sure to check that out this Thursday. JumbleThink is all about helping you, the dreamer, the one with the big idea, to create something awesome and change the world around you. One of the ways we do that is through our podcast, but we also are excited to announce our Idea Camps. This year, we're going to be launching our first ever virtual Idea Camps, and I want to make sure you're a part of it. Swing on over to jumblethink.com contact. When you're on that page, check out the newsletter section, sign up, and you'll be the first to know when we're launching our virtual Idea Camps. Virtual Idea Camps are going to give you some tools and ideas of how you can create a strategy around your idea, how you can make it no longer an idea, but a reality, and move you past what you have today and into a future of the unknown. Again, swing on over to jumblethink.com slash contact, fill out the newsletter form, and you'll be the first to know when our virtual idea camps are launching. I want to take a moment to thank you, the listener, for tuning in. It means the world to me that you would take time out to listen to our podcast. I really want to encourage you, go out there today, start creating that amazing dream and changing the world around you. Only you can do the destiny and dream you have. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant dans quelques mois. Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.